Oh my god, this is ridiculous. Fred, you're walking on water. You are beer Jesus. I'm the beer Jesus. I just want to say, this is probably one of the best experiences of my life. For the last seven years, Brad and I have been traveling the world, hunting down the best breweries and beers, as well as searching out the most amazing places to enjoy them. Drink it in! We've met home brewers in the Arctic to help judge at their beer competitions. We've witnessed the pure insanity of China's own Oktoberfest. We've got lost deep inside the mazes that make up Chechia's lager cellars. We've traveled halfway around the globe just to taste the best IPAs fresh at source and lots, lots more besides. These adventures have taught us amazing things about beer, brewing, people and the environment and how they all come together to create a culture we've fallen in love with. So join us as we explore the world through the medium of beer. Meeting master brewers, digging into beer history, brewing collaborations and trying to act sober against all the odds. Through our travel documentaries, beer school episodes and sofa sessions, we'll teach you everything you need to know to enjoy beer at its best and to appreciate the wonder that is the world's favourite alcoholic drink. We're here to show you that at the end of a long day, all you need is love and beer. Welcome to the Craft Beer Channel. Ah, oh, that's bloody. Doesn't it bring back memories, mate. Don't know why I'm touching my boob when I say memories. But <laughs> welcome to the Craft Beer Channel live show. It's our first one of 2023 and we have started with a bang. Yes, we have. We're going with Verdant. I was trying to think of if any of these beers sound like bang. And with Hell's definitely doesn't sound like bang, but that is what we're literally starting with. Like Hell's yeah. Yeah, Hell's yeah. There we go. There we go. Scripted to a T. Uh, thank you so much for joining us at 6 p.m. on a Friday. I'm sure you've all had to make sacrifices to be here, but we assure you this is going to be worth it. Uh, we have six incredible beers, two esteemed, well, one esteemed guest. I'll let them find out which one I mean. Um, and we're going to be having an absolutely delicious time drinking, uh, I think, one of the most exciting hop based releases for years. I, I haven't been this excited about an IPA for a long time. They need to sort of do, I guess it's like the sort of beer equivalent of Record Store Day, isn't it? The putty release every year. It's it is. A sort of very much everyone queuing to get in there and get the, the hottest release, the hoppiest release. Beautiful. Top of the hops, yeah. So uh, this might well be your first Craft Beer Channel live show. So firstly, welcome. Uh, my name is Johnny and hey, I got it right. This guy uh, is Bradley. As you saw from the intro, we travel the world talking about beer and pretending it's a job. Um, we do monthly live shows with breweries where we, we get to dig into their amazing beers and the lovely people behind it. Uh, and this is how it works. We're going to be drinking all six of the beers tonight, but you don't have to. In fact, if you're if you're the only one drinking, uh, please don't, because um, that, that could end your weekend very quickly. Um, these beers are quite strong. But if you're sharing, feel free to join in uh, and uh, we won't. Well, I'll be finishing this one, that's for sure, but maybe not the others. Um, we will be drinking in this order. And if you need a reminder, uh, I will be putting it in the comments and bringing this up uh, sporadically. So we're starting with the Hellas, Russian Substance, Even Shots, Putty, which will happen probably about quarter past seven, we reckon. Um, and then two more after that while we do a Q&A uh, with the guys from Verdant. If you can't get your comment heard through the mire of wonderful chat and questions and banter, uh, you can support our channel, pay a tiny bit of money, and we will answer that question at the next immediate gap in what James is saying. Um, so, yeah, you can just give a little bit of money, support us, and get that question answered straight away. 
Um, or you can just throw us a little bit of money and say thanks for hosting this show. Um, you can also join our Patreon, uh, which gets you lots of merchandise and access to our amazing Discord forum, uh, which is full of beer geeks, homebrew tips, uh, the culture share, where we talk about all kinds of other uh, amazing art and science and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and that's two pounds a month. And you can join us in there and also support the channel. Um, I think that's everything. That's about it, isn't it? I don't think we, we don't shout enough about the Patreon, but that is how we sort of travel around the world and, and sort of manage to make this content is the amazing support um, of, of our Patreons. And, you know, we're making independent content and uh, it's it's great to kind of keep it that way if we can. Yeah. So thank you, everyone that already has. And thank you, everyone that I'm sure is going to sign up tonight. Anyway, enough of that nonsense. So we are very, very uh, excited to have uh, James and Sam from the brew team of Verdant with us. James, of course, is also uh, a founder of Verdant. So he's been there since the start. So hopefully we're going to get the whole story of Verdant, of the original double putty. I know there's quite a few people out there that couldn't get the triple, but do have uh, the original putty. So we'll also talk about that beer and where that came from as well. Um, so yeah, without further ado, let's get the Verdant guys on and then let's get a beer in the glass. Welcome to the Craft Beer Channel live stream. Thanks and Sam. Hey, hi. <laughs> that Sorry, was just I'm really fun watching, watching you guys do stuff for ages. That now we need to participate. Is that how yeah, it is? You've got, you've got to bring the energy now. I'm done. Okay, cool. Um, no, no, welcome to the show. Shut up. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you for joining us. Um, I guess we should get a beer in the glass first. Let's not beat about the bush. Um, Can you introduce yourselves first and tell us what you do? Oh my God, sorry, yes. Yeah, so, or should we introduce each other? No, I'm, <laughs> I'm James, one of the founders of Verdant, Caster's head brewer now, I guess, doesn't do any brewing. Sam and his team do all of that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I'm the brew manager. So yeah, all of the, the work production. It's me and a couple of in, other guys. In America, they call you the when they call you the brewmaster. Who me? You. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> You're too uh, modest. Very, very, very We're definitely a brewmaster. <laughs> well, well, we'll all be the judge. We can do a vote at the end as to whether James is a brewmaster. Yeah. Um, let's do that. <laughs> and Sam, did you introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm the brew manager. So yeah, like basically all the sort of hot side work production is me and a couple of other guys. Um, and we get involved with a few other bits and bobs too, such as this. Such as yeah. this, yeah. Thank you for uh, for stepping in. I promise this is going to be so not at all painful. Just waving um, randomly. That's just great wave at the randoms. <laughs> uh, we've already got co compliments rolling in. Unbelievably clear. Try to keep the, the tone of surprise out of your, uh, out of your voice yeah. there, Richard. Um, t tell us before we dig into the history of Verdant because we'll, we'll need to cover that a little bit. Tell us, <laughs> oh god, say again, god, sorry. <laughs> um, t tell us, tell us about this beer that everybody's just cracked, and then we'll get into the history yeah, of Verdant. So, the Hellers is, um, <laughs> the Hellers is well, it started off as a collab with Stu Mostol in uh 2021. I believe. So we kind of devoted 21 to working out how to make good lagers. We've always wanted to make a good lager. We didn't really know what we were doing. And then we devoted a couple of tanks to be able to brew them uh, week in, well, every four weeks. And so we worked on a German Pilsner and a Hellers. Um, it's no secret, really. I think all you know, craft brewers or brewers full stop just love lagers. Um, at the end of a shift or whatever, you know, you don't really want to drink anything else other than a lager or a good car scale. And um, we used to buy in loads of Tegense and uh, Augustina or Paolana or whatever it was. And so it was a bit of a mission to go about how to... <laughs> it was a bit of a mission. Uh, sorry, Adam's just off camera there. <laughs> I thought it might be Adam. I can see the reflection of him in the window. Adam the Disruptor. <laughs> Get out of it. <laughs> um, sorry, it's gone now. Um, yeah, so it was just, I don't know whether it's this kind of cliche that, you know, we, we, we wanted to kind of perfect it for the sake of perfecting something, the sake of perfecting something, you know, that in its essence. Not really. It's just 
you know, having the tap room open now downstairs, it seems crazy to not have one a lager that we make on tap. But to try and do that style justice, you know, lagers from Munich especially or Bavaria, uh, we just absolutely love. So it was a rabbit hole that I and then everyone kind of had to go down. <laughs> um, but it's it's been really really enjoyable, and we've kind of. So 21, 2021 was the year where we start, really worked on them. So it, the Hellers, then the German Pills, and we flip-flopped between them. And there were some very crucial collabs as well. So the, that one for the Hellers with the Stu Mostov was very crucial. The, the head brewer at the time had trained in Germany for a few years. So the knowledge that he brought to it was amazing and, and helped out loads. We sort of incorporated something called a mash-out decoction which uh, he brought onto the scene. I hadn't even heard of that. You know, I thought that decocting a, a, a mash was something we wouldn't be able to do, but there's actually a clever way you can, you can do it with the final third of the mash. So you transfer um, most of it and then boil what's yeah, on yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. So you, you do these various steps, um, it, quite a convoluted step, uh, mash step regime. I think there's like four or possibly five if you include mash out. And then the final, the, the penultimate step, 72 degrees for 30 minutes or so, we then shift two thirds of it to the Lauter Ton preheated and then bring the final third to a boil for a, a minute or two and then transfer that final portion to the 72 degree portion, mix it all up and you're, you're somewhere around 76 to 78 degrees or the mash out step and then do your uh, recirculation, runoff and sparge and et cetera, et cetera. And we're doing that a lot more now, or, or Sam and his team are, because we're, we currently have two tanks over there with 12,000 litres of Hellers in each of them. So oh, that's yeah. gone from a very, we've basically tripled our lager production this year, and we're concentrating solely on this beer that we're sampling at the moment. So, so yeah. Is, is it like a classic, Heller's recipe. I mean, not a lot of German brews, I think, decoct anymore. But you, you've gone for that. Otherwise, is it you know German malt, German hops? Yeah, we use uh, best malts Heidelberg. Um, so very, very pale malt. It's um, I think two, two and a half EBC or slightly higher. Um, yeah, it's almost light lager colour, isn't it? It's yeah, yeah. Light. Well, it's so. I think. Well, my favourite Heller's from from Germany is Tegensee. I think it's the I think it's the best one. Uh, I think it's got some something else going on there. It's like it's almost a slight off flavour, or so, I don't know. I, there's something else in amongst the in amongst it all, which is amazing. But it's also incredibly light coloured. Mm -hmm. So that was definitely something that I wanted to incorporate into the Heller's development. Uh, what about the off flavour? You want to? Find one I, of them? Don't know. I don't know what, how to, I don't know whether it's one or it's a whole bunch of things. I, you know, it's just like a character mm -hmm. and it's, it's off flavor is, I don't mean that in a derogatory kind of way. It's like really it's a certain impression. Je ne sais quoi. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Exactly. Oh. It's, uh, I don't know what it is. It's, there's something there that all the other ones don't quite have mm -hmm. and it's incredibly soft and light and rounded and all that kind of stuff. Bit late for a phone call. Well, that's that's Tegan's air going. What the fuck? What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> what do you mean there's an off flavour? <laughs> Just maybe pick it up and put it down. Oh no, let's move to that one. Hang it's on. Probably one of the viewers <laughs> trying to beat all of the uh, the questions. <laughs> this is a first on the Craft Beer Channel live show. Chasing a phone around an office. So we're in the office. <laughs> a bit Benny Hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean. Off flavor, you say off flavor, you mean like not quite to style, I guess, not like a I guess it's just or a not, kayak issue. It's not, um, like everyone, well, not everyone, it's often said that a, a great lager needs to be incredibly clean. Um, I'm not sure about that. I think it's there's actually a, a lot of character in there, you know, like a lot lager yeasts are actually really expressive, I think. Um, there's a whole all, all sorts of things going on there. I, Lawrence in the cellar, he describes the, our lagers as they're fermenting, that it's like, it smells like Caesar salad, for example. Um, so there's, I don't know, there's just something in there. I think it's beyond descriptors, you know, it's just like 
comes under the umbrella of character. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we use the... the hell has had that. Like, Augustina is a little bit dank and funky, I swear. Augustina varies a bit. I've definitely had some that's been a bit skunky. Mm. Um, and then others which just aren't at all, you know. Yeah, just it's teg for me over over anything else. But, you know, I, whatever. <laughs> but I think... <laughs> teg whatever, yeah. Yeah. We've, um, so it's a very classical Heller's recipe. It's, um, you know, 4.8%. The gra starting gravity's, I think, 4.6 or 4.7, finishes at 10. Um, it's 100% Heidelberg malt. We use Hallertau Mittel for as the, as the hop. It's like, in a 40 hectolitre batch, we use five kilos, which is nothing. It's a low alpha hop anyway. Yeah. So I think we add it at, like, first work. 40 and 20 or something like that. Um, whereas if, if we brew a German Pilsner, you know, you, you hop a lot more. Uh, we put, I think we use 15 kilos of wow, a similar kind of hop for a German Pilsner. Um, uh, Martin from uh, Malt Miller is asking about um, lagering times. Yeah. So we, we, haven't, we haven't tried to shorten it. So we, we do eight weeks. We go eight weeks brew to glass. So uh, if you oh, uh, primary fermentation with our lager strains about 14 days um, to get down to terminal gravity and then we'll ramp down the temperature, we ferment at eight degrees, so pretty cool. And then we'll ramp it down to four and then to crop yeast and pitch into the next lager, obviously. And then we'll drop it down further to zero or 0 0.5 degrees and it will sit there for, probably four or five weeks after that ramping down weeks worth of step stepping down and then it will hold it there for about four or five weeks and it it doesn't clear up the this the yeast strain we use the Eyinger house strain uh, which is also another cracking hellers actually I think that's might be my second favorite <laughs> um, and then it's an incredibly powdery yeast strain so it's a lot of it's in suspension a fair amount gets in the cone as well uh, by dropping the temperature and making sure all the sugars have been eaten, it will encourage it to flocculate and then we can harvest it. At the point just before it's packaging, we reach a level of CO2 carbonation. You know, we're kind of trying to get it fully carbonated through spunding now, whereas up until recently we'd get it to about two volumes and give it a little tickle through the inline carbonation. But we centrifuge it. Right. So that final little bit, it just goes to the centrifuge, gets just polished, gets the, the, the final yeast cells that are in suspension out. So in one pass through the centrifuge at about four or 5,000 liters an hour, it looks like that, into the bright tank, and then the packaging team, go for it. <laughs> so we, we, we've made this very beautiful, very clear, nice, like lovely, bright malt and lemon kind of character. Yeah. What, um, I mean, well, you've already said that you, you, you brew it because you, you guys love lager and if you're making a lot of hazy beer, you want something a bit crisper. But has the response been big? Is it like local sales? Is it around the country if you're making you know, that much lager? I think, yeah, so the, the impetus behind the increased volume is there's a demand for it in the southwest, which is amazing, really. And that, you're going that head to head with the great Korev. Yeah, 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 <laughs> exactly. Just, uh, you know, we just want to make sure that there, there's a, what we view as a very good lager available to people in Cornwall and Devon and possibly Somerset, I guess. We can go into a boozer that serves other good beers by other breweries, but there's a, there's a good lager on. That's, pretty, that's a pretty cool place to aim, aim for. And I think the drinking culture down here tends towards that sort of thing a bit more. Yeah. You know, people's tastes are a bit more traditional and also you know summertime you're on the beach or whatever mm -hmm. what do you want yeah that's a good shout yeah well, um, yeah i've always reached for a light bulb but next time i'm down it's uh it might be a hell yeah. yeah 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 it's we're just very we're just very pleased and proud of it as well <laughs> well i think you should be like well it, i'd love to know what people think but we have had some lovely comments um which have got lost in the talk about our discord being a cult and me being the pope i'm not quite sure 
<laughs> uh, we've, just, uh, we've just opened the comments so we can see stuff. Yeah. All oh, right. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't worry too much about most of them. Very clean, very crisp. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, that's about all I can find amongst all the cult chat. But um, I mean, I, I think it's absolutely delicious. Oh, here's, here's a question for you. Oh, we're, we're getting homebrew pretty early. Um, I might yeah. come back to the water treatment differences between Hellas and Pilsner a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. Um, because we, we've got six beers to get through and a brewery tour. Oh, um, are we allowed to swear on this or not? Uh, you can now. On YouTube, if you swear in the first 30 seconds, you can get demonetized. But after that, they're like, yeah, fuck it. <laughs> so I, don't, okay, right. I don't really know why Just that is. It. That's why we put the video at the start, because then Brad can't <laughs> come with a bomb straight out of the gate. Um, right. Uh, tell us about the, the, the history of Verdun, just in a, in a nutshell, slash a small yeah. shipping um yeah okay so it's i can kind of give you that my my personal take on uh, the way i got into beer and then how adam and rich kind of, we got all got together so um i just really super interested in flavor cooking the previous business that i started with my wife was based around that exactly it was a fast food falafel business and it was making something very flavorful and sell it, sell it, selling it to people and we loved doing it but then we went on a trip to New Zealand and I started to this was in 2010 and we started to well I started to drink local beers visit breweries some, just something happened out there that had already happened in a trip there 10 years prior as well um, but it was this 2010 11 trip where I was drinking beers in the Nelson region and then in the same day driving through the trying to find the next place to camp for free but driving through the hop fields of the Nelson region it was all far too romantic um, and really really beautiful and it just uh, flicked a switch in my brain and I just like I, I needed to figure out how to how to work with these hops and make some beer and, and then came back and started to drink or no, pay more attention to the newer flavours in beers in, that I was drinking in Cornwall. So, like uh, Proper Job or, um, you know, some local, like car scales mainly, to be fair. It was like Proper Job or, I can't remember some of the other brewery names, I'm really sorry. Skinners? Um, Skinners? But they were just like really citrusy, you know, that suddenly there was loads of this grapefruit going on. And I was like, well, what the, it was blowing, it was genuinely blowing my mind. I was like, wow, this is all coming from hops. So very quickly it snowballed into, you know, a stock pot and lots of grain and the freezer full of hops very, very quickly at home. I remember the first pale ale I brewed was a Citra Nelson pale ale, USO5 yeast and, and very simple and clean, but it was, I took like a base recipe from somewhere, I guess on the internet or a homebrew book, and then in straight away I just doubled all the hops. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the, first, the first brew ever, and I just went. And New England IPA was born. Yeah, well, no, this was like um, it was just it was actually like a Westy pale, but really punchy. It was bloody. I got very fond memories of it, you know. Um, so that was kind of my entry into it, and it was really like. Uh, getting bitten by the bug, essentially, uh, and then I got, I knew Adam, we used to play five-a-side football each week, and um, I haven't done that since our second child was born, which is like nine years now, <laughs> but um, yeah, every Wednesday we'd play football, and you'd play football, but really you played five-a-side football because you'd go and have several pints in a chosen pub afterwards, and uh, we just, you know, we we were, uh, we can get quite excitable, me and Adam, and um, we just kind of got get carried away, you know. Like Adam's a very creative guy; for, his background's very creative um, to some extent. I am as well, but then so, you know, maybe a bit more science based. I don't know. But the we got super excited and energised by this. You know, let's start a fucking brewery. <laughs> This looks like, have you tried, try this homebrew? And Adam was like, yeah, I'm home, I'm homebrewing as well. He was actually going to the States quite a lot with his previous company. And I remember him being like, yeah, I was out there and I was drinking this and, and it. And it was like, yeah, what, what the hell's going on? And so it all just kind of snowballed. 
Um, and then it, we, we kind of fell quite naturally into our two distinct roles. I was quite clearly incredibly geeky uh, about the flavour side of it and brewing. Uh, and Adam was, is, is and was very astute with the whole flavour appreciation and just like, you know, feeding back and, and obviously his stateside connections and all that kind of stuff it was really, really useful. And then we just were like, Look, let's do this. So <laughs> we rented a shipping container, 20 foot shipping container in a quarry, Trinoeth Business Park, just about three miles over there. And um, had no idea what we were doing really. I remember buying like uh, 200 litre stock pots, a whole bunch of pumps, pumps and stainless steel, this, that and the other, plumbing bits, spending hours on BES website trying to figure out how the fuck do you get that half three quarters inch BSP thing into that and then like you know literally hours ignoring my family <laughs> young family looking at BES website have a look at their website you'll understand Where's James he's in the shipping container again yeah <laughs> YouTube. yeah 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 exactly and um and then we I got we kind of got it all set up uh there with and we purchased three 200 litres of fermenters and the idea like we kind of the brewery's all based on threes we kind of got locked into this three week schedule it just seemed right so we started with three fermenters everything's divisible by three <laughs> and then um I, we wanted to start brewing and we the i was like oh man i'm melting the fucking electrical cables here and that led us to meet rich who pointed out very helpfully after he was introduced to us through a mutual friend that we <laughs> of course it's going to melt the cables because you're doing this you fucking idiots and so uh yeah it was very obvious that we didn't have the power supply he changed it all with the shipping container to move he fitted it out amazingly and we were just like oh yeah we this is someone that we are severely lacking in this business. You had two creatives and wondered why things yeah. were melting. Yeah, <laughs> one who actually got their head screwed on. Yeah, exactly. And, um, but Rich didn't come on board straight away. We were there in the shipping tent for about six months. I remember brewing, I think every Monday I devoted to a brew. This was while holding everyone holding down their other jobs. So I managed to brew, devote Monday to brewing and then I think it was like Tuesday night we would all rock up, usually crazy late, eight or nine or whenever the ki various kids were asleep and we'd bottle whatever had been brewed three weeks earlier, that weird three week cycle I'm on about and then we'd end up with about 400, 500 mil bottles <laughs> and then we would, uh, you know, that was <laughs> it's quite big test batches really and then we would be like dropping these bottles off like milkmen early hours of the morning around at friends' houses, just like trays, <laughs> trays of bottles and stuff. Uh, it was very, it was very garden shed, it, <laughs> blokes in their garden shed thing. But the, those first dozen or brews or so, they were like single hot pale ales. Like it was like this week's the Chinook one, this week's the Citra one, this week's the whatever. And it was this sort of, had a slight differences in the malt bill and trying out different yeast strains. Like we tried, we, we used London Ale 3 back then in 2014. Um, and I remember at the time, like what in 2014, looking at what was going on in the States. And I really vividly remember Treehouse uh, and seeing those Nate and those guys upscaling and, and, and Julius going from this clear beer to like a mud muddy thing and I was like oh well, that's really interesting what's going on here and then doing lots of reading and and I, I think I remember very vividly that at that point thinking that that's something that we need to do not not for the sake of commercialism but because it seemed exciting you know from a drinking flavor perspective and I really do believe that it, that was the nugget of the rest of the verdant journey you know well, um, let's take a quick pause there because I can see loads of comments saying, when's the next beer? So let's get rustling substance in and then we'll talk about the Baby Blue Warehouse year. Yeah, we just had a, question. <coughs> just had a super chat. 
uh, from Vega. He said, "If he, this doesn't make a lot of sense to you, but if he wears a, a robe, uh, I'll tell you I'm part of the cult of CBC. Will it be possible to taste putty at the experiment tomorrow? If I wear a robe and tell <laughs> I'm part of the cult, will it be possible to taste putty at the experiment tomorrow? I'm pretty sure putty is on it. I believe yeah. so. It, I mean, I just, I don't know anything about that. Okay. I just... You know, I'm I'm kind of responsible for the bit, uh, you know, help helping ensure that everything ends up like this. Sorry, Sam. That's okay. <laughs> um, oh, wow. I'm sorry myself. No, no, go, for it. go for it. I, for, I just realised we're sharing now. Yeah, the log <laughs> was, you know, we had our own. Mm. Um. Wow. Ooh. There's motto echo all over that. Browsers, yeah, cheapers. This is one of my favourite pale ales that we do. I think. Yeah, that's that's tasting really good. <laughs> I like it when the brewer's surprised by how good his beer is. Um, yeah. The hoodie's coming yeah, well, off. So, it must be good. This was a question I wrote down on the copious mm. notes I made because I'm a very prepared and professional YouTuber. But um, it kind of makes sense. Having heard your origin about New Zealand, yeah, I think every beer we have except for putty has new zealand hops in it? <laughs> or, oh no sharks at galaxy so you got the ones that don't have australian hops in well, so you're a big well, <laughs> big antipodean guy well yeah i just well not just me it's like um so just swearing rich just tried to be funny Oh, he's, just, he's just complimenting <laughs> um, his skills as an electrician, and then he comes in and. I know, yeah. He'll watch it later. He knows that we, that we think he's amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah, just they do. They just so different, aren't they? They. I mean, I can understand it if if uh, people don't like Nelson Sovin or um, I don't know Rewaka or Galaxy. I get it. You know, I can I can understand that. But what? What I love about them, and I think maybe speaking for other people here as well, is that they're just so different. You know, they really stand out. So, it'd be, can you imagine how boring it would be if it, if everything was just North American hops all the time? Yeah. It's just this, that, and the other. And it, when they and putting them together, it's it can just be a match made in heaven when when you get that little combination right. Then I'm not criticizing North American hops. Yakima Chief. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love them to bits, but it's, you know, it's a global game. This brewing thing is really, you know, the, the whole carbon footprint side of it is really an interesting discussion. But blooming heck, it's in terms of farming and specifically hops, it, it's looking at the world as a whole, the terroir of the world. You know, the hops from that region are like this. The hops from that region are like that. And then that's really, when I'm doing a recipe, I'm kind of thinking about that and, and what it's going to bring. I mean, we'll, well, we'll get to it eventually, but I feel the same way when people are very dismissive of things like Sabro and Talus. It's like, mm. we have lots of citrus mosaic beer. They're great, but let, let's not try and slag off these new hops that add variation to the, to the New England IPA it style. Exactly, yeah. Sabro is a really interesting one, isn't it? Did you want to talk about that later, or did you want me to talk about Sabro now? <laughs> We've got Sabro in Afternoon Rich, right? So yeah. we're going to be okay. <laughs> I can remember um, well, that. Yeah, we'll, we'll save it for then. Um, I'll just double-check the comments and see if anybody's got any questions. Uh, oh, yeah, we do. And then we'll get back to Baby Blue Warehouse. Um, do you guys get to select your hops over in, in the States, or...? New Zealand yeah yeah we, we do um we didn't man I didn't manage to or didn't you know me or uh, and a few other people didn't manage to go over last year unfortunately um but the Yakima have been very helpful with regards to us being able to look at COA's um certificate of analysis and and choose from what they've got which has actually been really interesting um and some uh, some really amazing lots like we were using a Simcoe cryo lot at the moment that I've n never seen that much total oil <laughs> it's insane and we've we've only got about 500 kilos of that um but blue and yeah 
I'm like super interested about the farm that that's come from. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you going to say a special couple of brews, or are you going to put that well, in? Simcoe's like, light bulb is a Simcoe animal. Mm. Light, light bulb just eats Simcoe and Centennial. Simcoe and Centennial. So it, those are two amazing hops to actually be contracting at volume, pretty considerable volume, because, well, Centennial is huge, so widespread spread grown in the States. It's... Um, and, and because of that, it's uh, the variation in its quality is huge. Um, you know, most hops have a pick window of like three days, but because it's so widely grown across hundreds of farms, it's obviously picked outside that window. It's not stored very well. But when you get really good Centennial or any hop, but specifically Centennial or any of those slightly older US ones, they're absolutely fucking amazing. And so when you get to a certain level of tonnage, contracting you you can start to select it and when we could start to do that with centennial and simcoe centennial we use crosby i think that's the best version of centennial in fact crosby full stop with any of those slightly classic us hops i think nail it the newer variety citra mosaic simcoe sabro whatever the hbc this that and the other yakima hands down amazing bath arse obviously as well as they're combined with their HBC output, but yeah, I when, forgot, when what, I forgot the, what your fucking question was. Sorry, it was about hop selection. It was when you do hop selection. Yeah, I was going to say like when I started here a few years back, one of the first things on like one of those weeks was everyone, everyone in the in the brewery going up to our sensory room and rubbing hops like, and and leaf hops. You know, even though everything obviously was. It's pelletized, like you know, amazing quality centennial and various other things. Yeah. Leaf that everyone just goes and rubs, sniffs, and, and has a good old sort of uh, sort of fill out of a form. Yeah, and you know, then they'll get given back to you. And yeah, I put the put in make an average, <laughs> put them in the spreadsheet. Yeah, and then um, then choose whatever you want. Yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, it's it, it, genuinely it's we're we're often very aligned. It's really interesting. They, you know, we're not sort of ser we we don't search for a specific Simcoe or a specific this. It's that I don't think that's really the best way about it. it like, you know, we don't mind if if a light bulb shifts in its flavor profile a bit year on year you know we're not trying to emulate ab InBev's output of whatever it's like you know it's gonna shift it's it uses a whole bunch of ingredients that are grown out <laughs> all around the world of course it's gonna shift but the main thing is when we're selecting hops it's about being excited about the smell so you know rather than trying to describe all these things that you're smelling it's just the main thing is like one to ten, how excited are you by it? If it's scoring highly, then revisit it and start to dive in and try and give it some descriptors. But that the most important score is that first are you excited out of ten. I don't think we're looking for like the most centennially centennial or whatever. No. You know, it's just how interesting and delicious is it? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, which is, it, it does seem like there's a real divide in brewing. Some people, I guess, particularly ones that are doing volume of one beer, are looking for the same thing every time. And then there's brewers that get excited by the idea that next year, you know, rustling sub substance probably won't smell and taste exactly like this. Although I hope it does, because like, like my yeah. my my emojis can't do that justice. That's the obviously like, usually my emojis just nail it every time, but um, I haven't, I haven't there's no line this. emoji. I haven't tasted point. this batch until now, but like, that's really good. Yeah, I drank <laughs> a lot of this over Christmas. Really? Yeah. yeah, it's it's absolutely stunning. I love it. Um, yeah, it's just it's just kind of on this, you know, it, it straddles that. Is it slightly too sweet? And then you're like, oh no, the hoppiness just keeps it in check, and then you know. It's interesting. No, I'm um, really pleased with that. Well, while we're talking, we've, we've had quite a few questions about hops and different things, so I'll just go through them. A couple of people have asked about modern British hops. Are you... Yeah. Well, sorry, not... No, they haven't said modern. 
are the car scales using traditional British hops and are you looking at modern UK hops for your hoppy beers? So the no. <laughs> <laughs> We, Next question. <laughs> no, no, not not at all. I get, can definitely dive into that. The we haven't got anything against British hops per se. It's um, and we've done a couple of cask collabs with British hops. Yeah. So we've tried Olicana, Harlequin, perhaps. Um, um, Jester. Um, what was the Brookhouse one? I don't remember. Anyway, but it was a bitter, wasn't it? Oh, it was Fuggles and Goldings actually. So Fuggles and Goldings from yeah. Brookhouse. And they're, they're great. It's, um, they're just, I don't know, there's something, it feels like the UK hop world is kind of at a junction. It's, it, need, it feels like it needs to catch up or it needs to make a few adjustments. I'm not suggesting that they need to figure out how to make the next Citra, not at all. I think it's, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with Fuggles, Goldings, um, Bramling Cross, whatever it is, Admiral, just exceptional. I think what the aim should be is exceptional versions of them. And it feels like um, we've we've been quite slow at that at, at turning that big ship into a, a, a direction to meet or mar at least marry up to the rest of the world's hot production. It's interesting. So I, really, I really hope that they get that they do because, I mean, of course, we want to use them, but it's just not quite there yet. I don't know. But also, there's a whole bunch of other things at play here. Like, um, you know, it's really expensive stuff to grow hops successfully. It's, it costs a lot of money. I mean, I don't know. I haven't dived into the business side of it, but I imagine it's really, really tough. Um, well, we we did we did a documentary on. Um, the hops that built the craft beer industry with, with Siren uh, last year. And then we also did our documentary with Meantime about um, trying to champion British hops. And a couple of things that we learned. Um, the first one is, is, is that, yeah, the equipment to process hops is incredibly expensive. Yeah. And the UK hasn't had the money, because it's been in decline, hasn't had the money necessarily to upgrade their equipment when you know the really stellar American hops came over. And the other thing is they were caught slightly unawares in the UK because like Cascade was crossbred in the 50s. Um, Simcoe um, and Citra. Uh, Citra was crossbred first in the 90s and, you know, it took a while to, to sort of yeah. come to the fore. So, you know, they've had this long run of like 50 years of, you know, uh, yeah, Cascade, Centennial, Chinook, all these beers, all these hops coming out. Whereas the UK in the like, early 2000s went, oh, shit. And so their breeding programs have had to be accelerated, be much quicker. They're not working with necessarily the equipment they want, and they are properly scrambling, yeah, um, to to catch up with that. I think. But I mean, what we found with the meantime documentary is that Harlequin, you know, we had some beautiful Harlequin and brewed with some beautiful Harlequin, and you know, in the right conditions, it can be delicious. And it's, yeah. Yeah, it's going to be a matter of how fast they can go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, no, exactly. And the, the other thing as well, I, I mean. I don't know about now, but certainly up until fairly recently, you know, maybe 2010, 2015, perhaps, the hop breeding program at Y College um, was world leading. Mm. And so the heritage of those superstar global hops that we, we all love to bits now is if you go back, it comes from Y College. Yeah, it comes so from it's all, it's like all there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all there. <laughs> it's it's amazing, really. It's like football. We fucking invented it, and we shit at it. You know what I mean? <laughs> He's saying it's it's not it's not coming home. Well, <laughs> oh, wait, no, it's rugby this year, isn't it? It's, it's, like, it's, it's got to come home. I know. I really <laughs> do hope it does. The other thing is that so I've been chatting a lot with a kiwi farmer called brent from max hops who we're working with uh, moving forwards now and uh, it's been really interesting talking about um, his approach to farming or his family's approach to farming but so new zealand hops he believes one of the main reasons why they're so different or unique is to, due to the ultraviolet light levels in new zealand there's barely any ozone layer over there you know, it's incredible, really. It's like it's like the asshole of the world. <laughs> Genuinely, I've heard that as well. Yeah, yeah. 
It's uh, so you know sunburn times are seconds rather than minutes. Um, skin cancer is through the roof, but the flip side is really great fucking hops. Um, but then over here, the our UV levels are incredibly low because of the island nature of the UK and the, the fact that we're often under a blanket of cloud, as anyone will know when they fly back, it, back into this place. <laughs> um, I thought that was really interesting. So, you know, UV and light levels are just absolutely key. And I think it's going to be very interesting for the UK hop growing business, market, industry, how, how they're going to be able to develop and grow because we just don't have the light. I don't know, but does that produce a certain character of hop? Perhaps. I think it shows in the UK grown American yeah. varieties that they just taste so English. Yeah, 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 it's like Chinook grown here is like, you know, it just, just doesn't have the aggression. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I also, like, I think things like Cascade as well, I hear Cascade's a very late bloomer, so you pick it extraordinarily late. Yeah, which uh, which you one maybe through October and. It's all got mildew. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that point new, yeah. So, yeah, there's challenges. Right, uh, we've got to move on to the next beer. You people at home don't have to. Um, an empty glass. There you go. We've smashed it. Um, so we're going to be moving on to Even Sharks. And, uh, I, well, I guess, I guess James, James will be telling us about the Baby Blue era. Tell us about that warehouse. Yeah, first of all, I'm going to say that there's no Simcoe in this, so stop fucking asking <laughs> Is There's that... never been Simcoe in this, ever. It was a label typo. Please stop. <laughs> <laughs> Please stop asking us about Simcoe. Um, yeah, so after the shipping container, Sam, go for it. <laughs> after the shipping container, we, um, we moved to... Oh, cheers. Man. We moved to... Oh, that smells good. <laughs> that is bad. That is good. Wow, that... Gosh, that just went straight on my nose. The... Um, we moved from the shipping container to a unit, um, I don't know, that was about four, four times the size, shared with a, um, oh, hello, is that a telescope? <laughs> <laughs> I was showing the, uh, the package on, Nate. Are you pretending to be a pirate? Are you, that's a bit yes, weird. I'm looking for sharks, I'm cool, looking for right? sharks, James. I don't know why we're <laughs> Irish, that's not pirates. Um, that's what, three weeks old? Three weeks old, yeah. So... Fucking hell. Wow. Please be surprised with this one. Just while, well, just while you're admiring your own handiwork, guys, uh, we've had two super chats in quick succession. Yeah. Um, any plans to increase distribution to Europe? I know it's half a British brewery right now, but we're hoping for a miracle. Yeah, I mean, the, we do really want to. It's Export is a very important part of the business. And um, it's growing as well. And it's about, it really is about being able to divvy up. The sales team have got a very hard job. They, there's a finite amount of beer and they need to you know, foster relationships abroad and at home, but not piss them off by not being able to provide beer. You know, it's, it's tricky. And um, the balancing act between brewing, trying to brew more, and then it potentially just hanging around. You know, we want people to drink verdant beer at its absolute prime. So it's a really tricky equation. I think it, for sure we, we want the export side of things to grow. France, for example, is just off the fucking scale with the, the demand for our beer. And it's, I think it's a case of not trying to flood the markets like this. It's just a good level of growth that's sustainable and and makes sense for both parties so it's happening is what i'm trying to say we also really love going to other countries <laughs> <laughs> so uh any excuse for more of that um and any other potential projects in the pipeline you know it's it's, it's exciting it, it anything like that's really really exciting so yeah it's gonna well happen. Given your love of Hellas, and given the fact that I know where Mr. Rouge lot lives because we had beers with him a couple of weeks ago in Munich, yeah, 
Sounds like you should go for for some tasty tags and bring some uh, bring some verdant along with you. Done. Uh, next super chat, Chris Price. <laughs> the world is going to end tomorrow, and you can only drink Guinness or Fosters. What would you choose? Guinness. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's easy. easy. Yeah, I'm not even going for a tan there. I'm going Guinness. <laughs> Um, so there we go. If you'd said, what if we'd said Carling or Guinness, Carling or Foster's? The question should really be uh, where you were as well. Like, if you were marooned on a desert island, would you want Guinness or Foster's? Guinness. Oh, yeah, still Guinness. Guinness. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, it's going to be Guinness wherever Carling you are in the world. Carling or Foster's, did you say? Carling or Foster's? Oh, man. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. How about this for a question? I'll tell you when what, I drink what, In what scenario? Would you prefer to drink Foster's over Guinness? And is Ooh, there a, like a is twist? There a... I can't think of one. I... If I was to like be upsetting an Australian, yeah, if I was trying, to, if I was trying to, it, desperately to, to save my life, I had to be able to successfully describe to someone what the color yellow was versus the color black. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, the only, I think I'd only the only time I'd rather drink it is if obviously I want to drink a shandy, and you, you can't really shandy a Guinness, can you? Only right. with champagne. Is Guinness and black a shandy? It's not really. Is it? Is it black velvet? Is it black velvet that's with champagne? Is that what it's called? Yeah, black velvet. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sure. I would I would argue that's not a shandy though. That's yeah something else. I think, shandy. I think <laughs> one of my earliest. Had, one of my earliest introductions to drinking beer was my dad letting me have a half a bit of shandy. Oof, nice. How was that? I bet it was good. Yeah, That's man, a bit of shandy. Really right. good. Or a, <laughs> a, a larger shandy with a little twist of lime cordial. Ooh. Ooh. When, I, when I worked in a pub <laughs> age 18, there were, like the kids that I went to school with who had like, stayed in my hometown, they all drank in the pub that I worked in on holiday. Uh, from uni, and that's that was their order. It was Foster's with a top and line. There you go. And there was one kid that drank uh, Stella, and he was like, "I, well, he was always pissed compared to the others. That's that's <laughs> the first thing. Uh, yeah. But he he must have been the money bags. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Think Stella was over a five or a pint in my pub even back then. Um, we used to drink Cronenberg Saison Soixante Quatre. <laughs> <laughs> De France. <laughs> when I when I did my blind lager taste test of like macro lagers, that came bottom. Yeah, it is yeah. absolute filth. Yeah. Um, Andy Higginbottom, the cans have hot side and cold side hops listed on them. Do Vernon have any plans to start highlighting or celebrating malts? I'd yeah. love us to. That's a good shout. Yeah, that's a really good shout. I think it's um, depends on what the beer is, right? Because it's. Yeah, sometimes not relevant. Yeah, it's well, just breakfast not, though, not relevant, this, right? It's not <laughs> interesting. But when we do stouts and things, it's not that interesting that the only thing yeah. is a hot side addition of a bittering hop. We should maybe list the malts on that. Yeah, that's, kind of a, thing. that's a really good shout. The, uh, I think, well, I know that our designer, James Wright, he um, sometimes, well, he struggles for real estate on the label. So it's about not, overcrowding you know there's a lot of stuff especially when you export cans there's a whole bunch of other things you need to get on there as well so if the, if the label becomes too busy it can it can affect the feel and vibe for it all and i get that entirely i think with beers that are, are based around malts like sam just said that does make a lot of sense so we can we could look into that the other thing is that we kind of have chatted before over the last two or three years about some way for consumers to be able to dive deeper into the recipe of the beer um, whether that's I know QR code or you know just going onto the website and finding light bulb and then the whole everything there or some kind of beer map all the verdant beers and where they fall on some crazy four four axis uh, graph I don't know but it, it's so we kind of chat about it and then realize how really difficult it is to do that kind of stuff and then we run out of time and just kind of carry on making beer and doing what we do there is like sort of semi often uh messages to the web shop isn't there about mm. you know a home brewer asking xyz yeah. question about things yeah which is always nice to see it is it's nice to see if you want to emulate it at home yeah yeah 
I really like those emails for sure. Um, we've had a couple of people now say, "Won't you talk about goddamn sharks?" Because I, it's tasting and smelling amazing. Um, yeah. I just want to say two things. One, green fruit pastels. Good shout. Mm, yeah, yeah. Two. I love Galaxy and New England IPAs because it adds an element of danger and raw and bitterness to a beer that can often be a little bit sweet. So, I mean, this is top five IPAs in the world for me, and it's tasting absolutely brilliant. So, Thanks, tell me brother. more about it just before we do our brewery tour. Yeah, so Sharks, I guess, was our first real attempt at a New England beer. So. Going back in this weird little time frame, this this history line, um, we'd move we moved from the shipping container to this next unit, where we same brew kit, but we added another three fermenters, so we had six now, still divisible by three, so we could um, we could brew twice a week and package twice a week, or we'll package two beers a week and brew two beers a week, um, and although you know we. We kind of knew we wanted to make the New England style. We wanted to try and learn how to make it. We didn't. We hadn't tried any of it. You know, we hadn't been to the states and done all this can share or buy, just going to the breweries and buying cans or can sharing and trading. That wasn't happening. It was literally, this is what's going on over there. Reading about it and then trying to do it. So sharks is the result of you know trying to figure out how to do it really. And uh, I think it was brewed first in 2015 i can't remember exactly when i could probably dig out the brew sheet somewhere over there um but it, it 2015 ish it's always been it's pretty much always been citra uh galaxy i there might have been something else in there in batch one perhaps which wasn't commercially released so like very small 20 litre or 30 litre batch or whatever and it it was really the first one where we tried to employ london l3 yeast that we'd used previously maybe a year prior and it was expensive to us to buy this pitch of yeast in and not know how we could harvest it and reuse it so it was a big step because we kind of thought we kind of knew we'd probably have to throw it away so that was a that was a lot of money at the time and we had just managed to secure Galaxy Hops, very small amount, enough for that batch. And um, yeah, I, I don't know, the name came from that first brew day as well. I, I can't remember exactly, I, I think Adam wasn't at the brewery, he was at home, so we, he was still holding down his other job, so was I, I just happened to have a dedicated brew day. We're chatting to each other on WhatsApp or whatever, I was probably stealing his Spotify account to play in the brewery and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> And then, uh, I don't know, it, I think it was, it's a quote from um, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Um, Danny DeVito did it. I don't know, it just came about. I think it might have even been a gif or something. And it, and it just stuck. And then became, I think we brewed it one more time or two more times in 2016 when, when we were prior to moving to the next site, which was the Big Blue that you're talking about. So it, this is like an intermediary site before Big Blue. And then we moved there in mid-2016, and it, it just became a regular, a regular offering, just dialing it down, getting better, um, brawling with the, uh, <laughs> the, the ferocious galaxy hop and how best to tame it. And, you know, Citra is great for that, obviously. Yeah, and it's just that. And then Neil was born out of Sharks to be a sort of slight counterpoint thing, ever so slightly darker and a bit maltier, but then, you know, juicier, perhaps, or all these other things going on. Mm. Pretty important well, beer. And it's, I, I agree, I think it's tasting better than ever, I'll be honest, right now. It's yeah. fucking banger. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, right, I think uh, so. Currently, in the comments, we've got people bidding on how big a pay, how big a um, how big a super chat they'd have to give us to all down putty. So oh, Stephen Clay's yeah. coming in with six hundred quid for us to down our putties. Um, I don't know about you guys. I'll take that. I'm assuming six hundred pounds per show person. Money, Stephen. <laughs> show me the super chat. <laughs> Is that each? Because I mean... yeah, I think it's each. I think it's got to be each. Okay. Like that, that's night right, over. Right. Um, but uh, no, 
uh, <laughs> is, um, pulp, pulp is actually it's probably my second favorite Verdon beer. Does, is, yeah, is Pulp ever coming back? Yeah, you've met, you've mentioned that about Pulp before. You, I don't know. I'm not sure whether it will, or if it does, it will be very sporadic. Bloom is another one that's kind of gone by the wayside somewhat. It Bloom, feels Bloom like, good, but you you make better IPA. Like what I love yeah. about Pulp is it was a it was almost like a mountain IPA before they were things like a yeah, yeah. Of two coasts. Yeah, super bitter but deliciously jammy. I would say Bloom's dead, and Pulp is isn't, but it's I don't know where. Oh, nice I don't know how we can squeeze it in. It's really yeah. about what, you, what tank can it go in and what volume. It would supplant something else. So until we've got more tanks and more flexibility, I'm not really sure how that's going to work. The, funnily enough, it was the first double IPA we ever brewed, um, and that was brewed in 2015, I think early or mid-2015. And it was just 20 litres. We used a brown moisture at the time. My goodness, that was an absolute banger. <laughs> we had it on a kegerator just out of a corny. I remember drinking that beer on South Bank Food Market or wherever the beer stall is there. Oh, yeah. And it just absolutely blowing my mind. <laughs> that was, yeah, yeah, a watershed moment. Yeah, for sure. It was, uh, it, was, it was almost single hop citra back then. <clears throat> it was like a, I would say, you know, fruit car is... It took a lot of learnings from, from pulp, really, um, and just changed the yeast. Um, it's really interesting. It was like it was straight up ma incredible peppery mangoes, <laughs> like it was insane. Uh, but it was with USO five yeast back, you know, that very yeah, first. Yeah. And it, I think it, pretty much ever since um, we brewed it once or twice at this site, and we would have used Chico or a Chico derivative for it um yeah so it's a really interesting beer in fact all those core ones you know light bulb headband bloom and pulp they kind of they're a real insight to the fact that we had new england on our mind straight away from day one but we didn't have all the parts in the puzzle because we were using us05 or or some form of chico um, because we didn't have the capacity to harvest yeast, we were using dish bottom fermenters, blah, 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 all that geeky, boring brewing stuff. But it meant that we were making these sort of hybrid ales, mid-coast or uh, hazy Westies, or, well, you know, I don't know how you describe it. You'd be far better at that. L lots of words for it now. Cal yeah. California IPA, some people claim, but I don't think that's quite right. But yeah, Midwest or uh, Mountain or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So we were doing, we were basically doing that from 2014 onwards, but um, not with any kind of preconceived notion of what we were doing. We were just uh, work, figuring stuff out, you know, having fun. Yeah. Uh, right. Well, let's see how far Verdant has come with our brewery tour. I believe Timothy has snuck in. I need a piss. Right. Okay. Good. Well, don't take the camera with you. Uh -huh. you, you pop to the loo. Um. <laughs> Timothy will be getting the roving camera ready, I hope. He is, and yeah. Sam, yeah. And Sam's going to sit there awkwardly. Yeah. What, what do you think? Can we convince you that Pulp should come back? I mean, I'm sold. I love brewing Pulp. Oh, right, All right, those, like, original recipe beers. I think they're great. Um, so, um, it's, not, it's never been brewed at the new site, has it? Pulp? Yeah. Yeah, I've brewed it a few times. Oh, have you? Oh, cool. Oh, so it has been yeah. relatively recent. One of the only double IPAs that gets a flame out whirlpool, which is just joyous. Like any <laughs> hot side IBUs, is that makes me excited. <laughs> yeah. When 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 you're adding the hops, are you if it, if it's like hot side, is it just still a bag through the window? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you, so when it comes to pulp, it would be quite a few bags through the window. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and just feels so nice to send it over, nice and hot. Get some mm. actual bitterness out of the thing. Although, you know, with our Westies nowadays, we have gotten a bit more liberal with the hot side hops. And I don't know if you've had any of our Westies recently, but I think they've, you know, they've hit their stride. In your um, your collab with Elusive, uh, I forget yeah. what it was called, it was magic. It was that, I think that was the one where we, we sort of nailed it, uh, mm -hmm. like kind of hot side 
bitterness wise and you know a really pale malt bill everyone thinks a Westie needs to be a bit sort of caramelly but you know Andy was a, it was, it was a great great brew day great collab and yeah I think the beer sort of speaks for itself yeah, I agree. I think I think West Coast have gone that way, like in reaction to New England, like get any stickiness out and yeah. be, you know, blow dry and all about that kind of. And they're um, a beautiful expression of hops. They're just different expression, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's dead exciting. You've got another one coming out next week. Yes. Yeah, I'm really excited for this one. Um, yeah, it's a, a collab with an author called David Keenan. Um, and yeah, it's a really great brew day. So yeah, I think it'll be a banger. Awesome. Good, good hop combo. I won't spill the beans on it just yet, but it's a bit of the old and a bit of the new. It's good. <laughs> we'll leave that to Timothy to do next week. Right? Is that James? Cool. That's James. So uh, we are still drinking even sharks. Uh, give me one sec, guys. Uh, the drinking order. We will be back in with Putty after this brew tour. We thought we'd do the brew tour first to give you guys time to empty your glasses. What are we up to, um, Johnny? Is it six hundred pounds to down party, or has it has it exceeded that at this point? Well, they they've decided to switch to six hundred pounds to brew pulp again, <laughs> which actually oh, okay. I'm I'm, I'm more behind. Cheap. Yeah, I'm more in favour of that too. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, I'm going to switch over to the roving camera. Uh, you guys. There we go. I worked it out in the end. <laughs> well prepared. Thank you. After you. Tim? Me. <laughs> brewery. This is the best view, really. It looks stunning. Very shiny. There's some foliage as well. Wonderful. We can't. I can't hear what you're saying. So if I talk over <laughs> you, I'm sorry. You're on your own then. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. There's the tap room. I mean, it might be worth just looking in there. Right? Yeah, we might have a look. Here you go. <clears throat> This is the sap room. Friday night? Yeah. 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 Friday night at the tap room. Friday Great vibes. <laughs> so yeah, we kind of got the, the malt handling side of things. I come around here. Yeah. Silos, two 27 ton silos out on the left here. CO2 tank, Roy's trailer that takes all the spent grain. Um, and then we've got loads of sacked malt here. And so Sam and his team take the recipes and they mill everything for each batch in that guile. Over here, there's a full roller mill at the back and a grist case on uh, scales, digital scales. So you can, they know exactly how much we've got in there. And then the brew deck itself is just over here. Worth mentioning that uh, Jim, one of the brewers, is currently finishing a brew yeah. of light bulb. So there might, are some might have a bit of background noise sound going on. We just kind of just moved on to the brew floor, and then yeah, we're on the the ground floor at the moment. You can see the innards of the brew deck. Apparently, there's 11 pumps and 432 valves under there. I'm, I've never counted them, but you know, I, I say that every time. Here we go up. Yes. So yeah, here we are on the brew deck. Everything is controlled by the HMI screen. We can see each vessel through the screen. And we can also control the temperature on every fermenter from this screen as well. So 
makes life reasonably easy. We've got um, these tanks here are all water tanks at the back. Towns water, and this is a uh, cold water or a cold liquor tank, hot liquor tank. And then we've got the mash tun or MCV, mash conversion vessel. There you go, can you see in there? Big paddle, lots of steam jackets. Um, and then when the brewers are mashing in, they pull the malt over from the grist case, trundles along this auger, down through the hydrator, gets hydrated at a specific temperature, and then they target their temperatures, pH, etc. in here. Mash rest is completed, and then they transfer it over to the lactor. There's a German-style brew house, basically. Um, thanks, Sam. <laughs> Uh, there's the yeah, other bulb on this one's gone or the light's gone or whatever but that this is a big louse sun 2.8 meters in a diameter rakes that go up and down is we put anything between about 600 to 700 kilos in there up to uh, 1800 i think 1800, 1800 is kilos. the max uh, well one of the beers that we're going to be drinking in a minute actually yeah <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah i but i punish the brewers <laughs> the rest of things somewhat um then we've got the kettle over here, very basic vessel, it's just a thing <laughs> with a smash plate. So the boiling actually happens outside of the vessel in an external work boiler that Tim could probably point out under there. It's a big silver tube. Is it under the I steps? It. Sort of there. there. That thing there, that one. That, that's where the boil <laughs> happens. Amazing. So that sits at about 104 degrees and the kettle at about 100 or just over and then we know we've got a boil happening and it's recirculated. The physics, the actual physical motion of a turbulent boil happens through the smash plate. When the boil's completed, it gets fired into the whirlpool, um, either knocking out some temperature or not via a shell and tube heat exchange, which is this tube here. Uh, so a lot of the New England, or all the New England beers will, top, will take out 20 degrees or so before adding a ridiculous amount of oxygen to the whirlpool. If it's a West Coast beer or a lager uh, or a stout, if we're adding anything there, which we probably wouldn't, then we'd do it at a flame out temperature. So we'd finish boiling, fire it through into there at 100 degrees or as close as, and add loads of hops. This is, a, this is the most basic vessel. It's just, there's nothing going on in there except it's wide to allow for a cone of hops. Um, each section has its own CIP set, clean in place set. Uh, so this is the brew house one. And then the, the gantry leads all the way up to the top of the fences. Do you want to go up there? Let's go. So, yeah, here you've got 12 fermenters, FBs, one, two, three, four, etc., all the way to 12. Each one of these holds um, 12 to 13,000 litres. And then at the end of each row, we've got a corresponding uh, bright tank or packaging tank. So pretty much all our beers will get centrifuged to some degree on their way to the bright tank, ready for packaging. Um, yeah, that's it. So we, we still dry hop through the, through the manways, old fashioned style. We don't have any fancy equipment on the ground for pumping it in or recirculating or, or whatever. We just throw the hops in there and rouse through CO2. Um, what else do we do? Yeast pitching. We'll either pitch dry yeast in through here and then harvest and pitch cone to cone downstairs. Yeah, there's a really good view of the corner of the building from up here. Yeah. So you can see the office. That's where we were just sat yeah. doing this uh, video. And then we've got the tap room downstairs and all this corner. So, yeah, this was just an empty space up until, uh, well, just over a year ago when we opened. Pretty amazing. Uh, do you want to walk along here? We can. Yeah. So we're, my head's at about seven metres at the moment, or six and a half. <laughs> it's quite high. Yeah. Oh. The wide angle lens really makes that feel quite <laughs> vertigo. -like. Should have had a warning there. Yeah. <laughs> it's the wide angle. Come on, down the ladder, lads. Oh, the ladder. Sick so those are the bright tanks there and there. 
and there's the the canning line at the end so uh, it's actually a pretty good view of the canning line so over on the right hand side you've got the depalletizer there so uh, 18 layer pallet of cans goes in it gets lifted up a layer at a time a layer gets scraped off onto the conveyor down it goes twist rinse and then along trundles along into the canning line does about 80 75 to 80 cans a minute rotary canning line counter pressure out gets x-rayed for level fills anything that's not within spec gets booted into a bin then it carries on round accumulation area labeling machine the accumulation there is for when label reels need to change which is often and then the, the cans will build up over here and then they get labeled and then through to the final accumulation where they get put into boxes manually yeah exactly um, so there's a whole bunch of boxes made for whatever's being packed on Monday the uh, mezzanine over there actually Tim so this used to be the web sales up here uh, it's now just cardboard storage and we actually do the web sales downstairs so every day the web sales stock comes out of the cold store which is behind these silver cans just here that's the cold store so each day the web team bring out their pallets of beer over to there and then pack the orders that have come through and are coming through dpd take them that day and off they go so quite often i'll be looking at people checking in our beers on untapped i do look at untapped a lot <laughs> and they check they're checking them in and that's like the day after the day after some a human being has put them off the canning line into a cardboard box taped it up it's less than 24 hours later it's in the outer hebrides or something and someone <laughs> drinking it that's fucking amazing and saying best beer ever three and a half stars <laughs> Go. Yeah, I, th I think it's putty time. Thanks, Johnny. It's putty t -t 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 time. Putty t -t 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 time. It just might be one view. Oh. Sorry, Jim. <laughs> be careful here. Just a really cool view. Oof. There you go. Stainless city. Over there. Anything exciting in these tanks, James? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is like proper, like BBC regional. That one is... <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I played trumpet on that tune. Oh, oh, wow. Who's there? <laughs> He's running away. That's Adam weird. is running away. <laughs> What's he doing just hanging out in the cellar? <laughs> That's what he does on weekends. <laughs> hey, Adam. <laughs> Hi, Pekka. <laughs> oh, dear. That's the centrifuge. That centrifuges things. It spins really fast. Makes a lot of noise. Spins really fast. Oh god. Oh. Hey. Again? <laughs> oh. Um right thanks. Right thanks. This one's cold. It's got a delicious light bulb. Light this bulb, one's yeah. got light bulb in. That's the DO, these are the DO numbers. So uh -huh. all right. There we go. These were the biggest oh. tanks from the old site. Oh wow! So that's over from Baby Blue. That's nice. So yeah, these we had to used to brew twice into to fill one of these, and we'd have to brew over two days. Whereas now that's a single brew length here, and we can brew three times in fourteen hours or something. Oh. <laughs> so Adam is watching the the YouTube live at the same time, <laughs> so you might hear. It's I'm like right. delay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow, Fr Fridays at Verdant, blimey! <laughs> yeah, I don't want to alarm That's anybody, but somebody's using oh, your no. laptop to <laughs> okay. up in the office. I think I think some skullduggery is happening. Look at this. 
What is this? Cream. Custard what are they? Custard creams. Are you working on a on a pastry Digestive. stout recipe? Oh. Sorry? Are you working on a pastry stout recipe? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're not, Johnny. Oh, hang on. Oh. Maybe Richard, we can't ignore. Oh, yeah, that's true. Last but not least. Look at this. Oh. Oh, my. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my. That is an insight to somebody's brain, isn't it? You see? You Blimey. see? Can you see what I mean? Right? That shipping container. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> 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 While you're in his office, Rich is literally using your laptop, Timothy. I can see him. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't, I can't trust them. That's the problem. I don't, I don't want to know what he's bringing up on screen. <laughs> oh, let's okay. look at some hops, quick. Let's, okay. let's go in the fridge. Well, there you go. This is a test of the Wi-Fi if ever there was one. <laughs> hops, beer, lots of hops. Oh, oh, oh. Lovely. Come on. All right, let's go. Let's go back to the office. Yeah. I think you should just go in the tap. <laughs> Mr. Rougelot in that comment has wildly outsized uh, ideas of how big the Brudio is. Okay, let's go. We're going to go through the tap and then back in the office. Okay. Oh, wow. Deep rubbing. Oh, wow. Gosley, that's a good one. I can't believe we didn't film this at Verdun. Think of the pizza we could have afterwards. Look at the beef. Look at the beef. It's Alex. Hi, Alex. He's our buddy. He's our tap room manager and amazing mid-changing veterans. I'm going to start chanting Putty in a minute. Putty. 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 Uh, gee. We, we, we've got sign off forms from all these people that they're happy to be filmed, right? Christ. That's a <laughs> good night now. I didn't even consider that. Eek. What a beautiful tap room. Merch sales. Nice. God, this is as bad as when we do our Discord forum pitches, you know? <laughs> it's turned into, a, um, into an advert. Speaking of which, you can join our Discord from £2 a month. <laughs> Get access to me and Bradley and an, an army of amazing people. Hey, friends! Number <laughs> three! I just meant to Hey! Oh my god. Can't wait to see what he was up to on Timothy's laptop. The DJ, Master of Ceremonies. Can you show these people? In the mix. Let's go. Party, 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 party. Wow, that was cool. That's great. A, a cathedral to beer, if ever there was one. What a beautiful mm -hmm. uh, space you got there. Fantastic. There you go. Right. What has Rich done to this laptop? <laughs> I was kind of hoping he would, you would have come back with sort of like bunny voices where he'd. Oh, put yeah. Put a they put a on filter there. on. That would have been lovely. What laptop? What are you on about? Rich was up here while we were oh, was roving. He? Yeah, oh, I could see him. What was he, he was doing stuff on the laptop. <laughs> Markies or something. Uh, sneaky. Yeah, right. Okay. So let, let, let's build up some some hype here. This is the second triple IPA you've ever done. It is a triple IPA version of your most hyped IPA, which you make yeah. once a year. Yeah. It's something you said you'd never make triple IPAs. Is that true? I can't possibly say. 
<laughs> but <laughs> so I don't, how do you want to do this? Should we just get straight in and then we'll ask the questions? Okay. Okay, let's do this. So here Bam. it is. It's happening. Oh, yeah. Sam's going to do this again. <laughs> Oh, nice. Beer in a glass, two finger head. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke on the opening. Hi, Simon. Uh, wow. Man, that poured look thick. That. Oh, my God, look at it. Yeah, that poured that out like bubbles. double cream. You could, yeah, it did. You could see the bubbles slowly climbing up there. Ooh. It looks like, I mean, the bubbles move so slow. There's a viscosity to that. Great. I love the colour of putty. Yeah. So it's so like Golden Promise is a base over Extra Pale. Well, actually, this one's a mix of the two to try and stop prevent it getting too dark. Yeah. Yeah, somebody's called it in the comments what I was about to say. Where's it gone? There we go. Blood Orange. Hmm. Yeah, pine, a lot of pine as well, I think. Sap, very sappy on the nose, but in a, you know, in a way that's not scary. <laughs> that, the body on that is like... Holy crap. <laughs> this is the first time I've really tried it other than a tiny sip on packaging day. This is, oh, really? This is young. Wow. When was this? I find it, it's almost like more mangoey than regular putty. Yeah, definitely. I, Jeez, I like is... on the bottom, it just says silly. I don't think I can focus on it. It literally yeah. says silly on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Wow. That is um, an experience, right? It's pretty special, guys. It's just putty on steroids, basically, isn't it? Yeah, you yeah. know. Wow. Just so yeah, I mean, I feel like we're struggling to get this across. It's got the viscosity of like of orange, like real orange juice, like really, mm. really uh, thick orange juice. It's got blood orange character. It's got intense booziness, like almost like Campari kind of bitter and booziness. Yeah. And then yeah, loads of mango sweetness as well. Campari's a good shout. That's a really good shout. It's beautiful. In its booziness. Yeah. yeah wow. It's, um, I'm trying to gauge the bitterness. It's like front and then, for me, front and then middle sides of tongue kind of thing. It's not like a weird uh, swallow, you know, like that, where it, it can be a bit like a... <laughs> I don't know. It's not. It's <laughs> not hot burn, and it's not chalky, and it's not powdery. It's none of the. But it's issues of strong and assertive, and kind of, um, the kind bit, of it builds, you know, evolves. after the sip. Yeah, like sort of, I find it like evolves. Yeah, it evolves. It doesn't build; it evolves. Yeah. But Sam's a, a hard taskmaster when it comes to the New England style. So I don't know, Sam. How are you finding this? I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, genuinely like. It's aggressive, yeah. right? It's an, it's pretty aggressive, but I'm, I'm not, not. Yeah, I'm not a massive fan of a lot of tippers, but I, I do yeah. love this beer. Like, yeah. it really works for me. I, I I think a lot of tipper New England tippers come across very sweet and very boozy, and I think the aggression that you're talking about, which maybe will round out, you know, over the a couple of weeks, but what what's here is balancing it. Yeah, you mm -hmm. know, it replaces the bitterness like, yeah, yeah it's a, exactly it's like a I feel like my tongue's sort of almost vibrating <laughs> that is an, a, an insane amount of hops it reminds me of um the really early homebrew sort of style attempts of double ipas and I, that's not i don't mean that in a in a negative way at all it's just you know it's an insane amount of hop flavor that's being crammed into the beer um yeah god i'm pretty pleased with it i'll be honest <laughs> <laughs> i think you should be i think it's yeah it, it's absolutely bonkers silly um, putty someone has silly said putty. there you go that is spot on. Got it. yeah um 
So, so tell, tell, tell me about the genesis of, of, of Putty and why you were persuaded to do a triple version. Yeah. Okay, so Putty, it, I mean, it's probably done to death, isn't it, to a certain extent, but it, it was first brewed in 2017 for um, Green, not Green City, Hop City. Green, <laughs> Green City was in Brooklyn. <laughs> Hop City was in Leeds. And it was... Really, we'd, we'd, we were at Blue at that stage, so that our third site, if you don't include various kitchens. And um, we were already brewing double IPAs at the time. We'd definitely brewed PSI at that point, at least once, maybe twice. We uh, were brewing pulp fairly regularly. So we weren't new to the style, but we had just got our hands on some Galaxy. So although we were, we'd been contracting hops from day one, you know, at, at pretty silly volumes, to be honest, at gauging what we think we're going to need three years down the line. We kind of had to do that originally. And with Galaxy, it was impossible to do that back in 2014, 15 or 16. The same with Nelson Sovin. These hops just weren't available. It's difficult. It's easy to forget that, right? There just weren't these hops around. There was a hop shortage of North American hops. If you couldn't, if you didn't contract these hops, three, four years worth of these hops, then you just didn't have them. You didn't know you'd have them. So you can't base a business off those hops. So to be able to kind of find or, or just happenstance across uh, so, uh, some galaxy enough to brew the first putty, it was very exciting. And so I remember being, well, the three of us decided that, yeah, well, you know, let's do Hop City and let's go for it. Let's give it a go. So we used London Ale 3 yeast at the time. I can't remember if it was our version of it uh, or whether we'd bought in a pitch. I don't know. It was all a bit hazy back then. No pun intended. And then we, um, we just went for it. We used the LA 3 yeast and a, a crazy amount of hops. It was, it's the same recipe as original putty. It really is. There's not, there's hardly anything changed. Maybe a tiny tweak of an extra 100 grams of calcium chloride or, uh, you know, let's just shift that uh, wheat, flaked wheat down a touch just to uh, allow this or whatever, you know, but it's, it's minimal, almost to the point of not worth mentioning. Um, and then we did it and it was such a small batch as well. And we took it to Hop City and um, it was really just amazing how it went down. It was like this. It reminds me of this. It was so full on. And I think it, it took... Well, I think we had a bit of a name for ourselves at that point anyway. Adam would have been better to really comment about that side of things because he was the guy who was out and about on the road, you know, all over the place, promoting Verdant and, and, um, and really going for it. So he had built up a name for Verdant and the beers we had. And then when we got to Hop City with this one, I think, you know, we, we basically shook the shook the place up a bit because we were there were other half there i can't remember who else there were a whole bunch of hyped us breweries and that was our first ever experience of trying new england beers from that were actually brewed by american brewers was at that place and then we were like well here's putty what do you think we kind of invented this based off what we thought you might be doing do you remember what any of those americans said about it uh, I remember Sam, other half Sam, really enjoying it. <laughs> that's what that's what I remember. Yeah, um, I think it was my memory of it as a comparison. And memory is a really tricky thing, isn't it? Because you kind of it's not very accurate ever. <laughs> um, was that it was more complicated than the U.S. Uh, beers. So it had more uh, depth, and um, I think it, that could go. That can go one of two ways with with a drinker. It can be too complicated, and that be a bit of a problem, or it can be something that you're really into, and 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 you go down that rabbit hole. And I think that that's what Putty does. It kind of it's a fairly complicated beer. You know, you can really start to strip the layers from it. Um, you know, fruit car, for, as a side note, would be a, a simpler approach to a double IPA. Um, and it's really, it is a, its focus is citra, the malts there, just to kind of guide citra, citra, citra. It's all about citra, here you go. This isn't like that at all, it's something else entirely. Um, and it was the, 
uh, pinnacle of what Verdant was at the time and is, I guess. It's like riding that wave at the forefront of the New England style before it had actually fully crashed on the shores of the UK. We were already there. We'd be, we understood what we needed to do and we were doing it. Um, we were just kind of ahead of the game, basically. And we, we, we try our best to continue to be so. You know, I, uh, well, when, when we did our video of predictions for 2023, Brad and I thought that ABVs would go down this year. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for this. Um, Always, yeah. In one beer have dragged the average ABV of IPAs up. Hmm. Um, what, what do you think, uh, what, what, what do you think a tipper can give a drinker that a dipper can't you know why why go to these extremes um that's I, a really good question go for it, i think i just want even more hop yeah. saturation mm -hmm. like i don't think you know that the abv should almost be you know uh secondary to that you know it needs to facilitate just an even more crazy hot bill yeah. And and if it doesn't do that, and if it does lean on the sweetness, then I don't think it achieves what a tipper should do. They shouldn't be sweet first and foremost. They should be even more saturated with with hot flavour, mm. for my taste anyway. Yeah, I, I agree with Sam. The the incredible body that that's on this beer, which is like you know obviously the 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 aroma, the intensity is insane and is on another level compared to the the, the standard putty but the mouthfeel of it is just like any unlike any beer i've ever had that isn't laden with lactose and got a finishing gravity of something like omnipoya do like like 1.1 1. 1. so yeah is, is that coming is, is that coming from the from a water treatment? Is that coming from the alcohol adding that body? Is it coming from that hop saturation, like you say? Like, because hops can really affect mouthfeel, or is it? Mm. I guess all three is probably the answer. But. Yeah, I think it. I think it is all three. The uh, final gravity on triple putty. I think they, these came in at um, two eight twenty eight, so one o two eight or one o two seven. But these beers really push so, the limit of what the kit can do in terms of liquor to crisp ratio and yeah. the amount of grain we can actually fit in and the strength of you know uh of, of runoff we can achieve yeah mm -hmm. um i think dropping dextrose out of a lot of our well pretty much all of our double ipas yeah you know it really made a big difference in terms of body and, and mouthfeel it did for sure us. yeah yeah so the whereas regular putty would have I think an OG original gravity of one point oh seven nine, this one had an original gravity of one point one zero four. So it's good. there's considerably more in the way of in of malt there. Yeah. So you, you're inherently there's a hell of a lot more protein and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it's hopped way more heavily in terms of whirlpool and bittering. So we, we always bitter our beers with, with first work hopping, nice clean bittering hop. And then it's with the New England stuff, there might be some something around 15 or 10 minutes in a few of our beers. Um, and then it's just a, a big old, I think Sharks has a, the Sharks have an addition I think it used to, but no longer does. Did it go in the whirlpool only? Yeah, it's got whirlpool now. So, yeah, just it's just big. It's big, so the body feels big. Every, there's more of everything in there. Yes, the loads water, of the, oats and loads of wheat. Loads of oats, loads of wheat. Putty, regular and tipper is is really about. It's a very wheat focused malt bill. It's golden promise and wheat, um, flaked and malted. And then um, there's Gee, the, the GPL program. is the most of any beer, isn't it? Yeah, dry hop, G dry hop grams please is 30 in this one. And then the Whirlpool grams per litre, it was loads. I can't remember. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Say loads, yeah. 
a lot to the point where you know it was impossible to not transfer whirlpool hops over to the fermenter. Mm. I remember like, getting a sample part to take the gravity after I'd made it. And it was <laughs> just a, a, gra a gravity reading of just hops. I basically couldn't strain it out yeah. to get a proper reading. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't possible. You know, twelve <laughs> percent. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's pretty amazing. I just was just took a swig then, and that was like the. Um, alcohol cake so galaxy has that little aniseed thing going on so generally galaxies it, it, the good galaxy is very fruity resinous uh, but it, I, it's very rare that i'll smell galaxy that won't have an ode to some kind of woody aniseed thing going on and the worst galaxy batches have a lot of it the good ones don't have very much we we try and choose the really we can't select galaxy at source but Luckily, or fortunately, Bath allow us to, because we contract a fair amount of it, Bath allow us to select from the lots that they have. So it's amazing the variability. So we do try and choose the good stuff, but the alcohol here, I'm perceiving as a sort of aniseed alcohol. Yeah. Um, it's somewhere there in, in the background, in the base, and it's, I find it really pleasant and it plays off all the fruitiness. When I, I, I had a little sip while you guys were talking and, and, was slightly reminded of Sambuca, <laughs> which would be the aniseed booze. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Page there. Exactly. Yeah. Just a little flashback to university there for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> there might be enough booze in here to flame it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's give it a go. Um, right, we, we've got a hard stop at eight. So I'm conscious yeah. that we're 10 minutes behind. There's two beers we haven't tried. So oh, what? while brad and i pick out some interesting questions and everybody please feel free to put your questions that we haven't answered yet into the chat and we'll try and get to them we'll do like a a one a, a, a 30 second answer for James and sam um can you tell us about the two beers that we haven't drunk yet for people that want to drink those so tell us tell us about way beyond and then afternoon rich afterward yeah so way beyond the long blank which uh, for a while is just was just called new IPA, like anything before it's named. Um, yeah, it's a hop combination that I was always keen on. So I, th I just always thought Equinot and Nelson Sovin would work really well together. Um, that coupled with a slightly different approach to malt bill, I elevated the OG and FG a bit. So normally with IPAs, we go six, five to 16 to get 6.5, that's what Sharks is, like the, the beer that we're collabing on. And then uh, this one is more like 6.9 to 20. So the, with the whole concept of being able to aggressively hop it in the whirlpool and offset any kind of drag over of alpha acid IBUs by a little bump in the gravity. But really it's just about trying to create a shockingly heavily large fluffy bodied ipa you know that's really it um yeah and i i've i've had i had a can at home I, um i think last weekend and i was very pleased with it i thought it was actually a pretty special ipa so let's see what it's like yeah excited to try it um and then afternoon rich afternoon rich yeah here we go so another uh, a double ipa um, very much in the same realm as Fruit Car or PSI, so very similar kind of malt bill or uh, unconventional tactic. This is closely related to unconventional tactics. Um, and it's with this one, it was a different set of hops, hot side to cold side. So uh, there's so many beers coming out, I have to actually look at the label on this one. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. But as I'm looking at it, I, I'm reminding myself of why I did this. <laughs> so um, Cryo Pop and Sabro Hot Side. So Sab, we talked about Sabro, right? So it's a it's an incredible hop. I mean, I personally really love it. It's the most amazing hop to smell out of the bag. Like, it's just insane how aromatic that thing is. Um, and yeah, I can understand, you know, to, it can be like dill pickles. It's coconut, dill pickles and lime all mixed up together. It's crazy. It's really creamy as well somehow, mm -hmm. even in the aroma. Um, but lime does that to me anyway. Like I just need to smell limes and I think of cream somehow. I think it must be Thai green curry or something. Anyway, so hot side, cryo pop. So this blend from Yakima that's all based around survivable hot compounds, which I think works really well, actually. It comes across like refreshers. Do you remember those sweets, refreshers? Yeah, I yeah. think cryopop 
really out, out of the bag. I think that's one of my favourite. Cry about. Yeah, it's fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. So it's, uh, it's kind of feels like it would work really well as in a West Coast, to be honest, as well, like a uh, hot, hot and cold side. But it, it, I think at its best, it comes across like refreshers, those that really kind of sherbetty fruit thing. Um, Sabro. About for about two years now, we've we pretty much only put Sabro in the whirlpool, and my goodness. What a hot to put in the whirlpool! <laughs> wow, you don't have to put almost any of it in, it's like mental. a tiny amount, yeah. And on pack, you'll taste it, it's fantastic, right. it's super yeah. survivable. It just it yeah, just punches them up. So, all those other hops, so this one would have been at 20, we would have dry hopped this at 20 to 25 grams per liter. Um, and Equinox Galaxy Idaho 7, like those are not shy, <laughs> yeah, yeah, varieties. and it's. Well, we'll see in a minute, but I would imagine we'll notice the Sabro, and that's from a relatively small Whirlpool edition. Okay, so I've, I've gone straight for the uh, straight yeah. for afternoon rich. Um, yeah. you open I'll, this? I'll come back uh, for the long bank. Um, Which one? Yeah, you want? What you want. We've only got time for one. So oh, it's, what do you want? I don't care. The, you go for it, mate. Okay. <laughs> um, and the, the Sabro is really nice. It adds, like, yeah, like you say, coconut creamy. Uh, do you notice it? Yeah, yeah. I haven't tried this one yet. I try. I've tried Long Blank, and I thought that that was uh, really, really good. I've not. It's definitely, it's definitely there, but it's not in a way that Sabro haters would would turn their nose up at. Yeah. I think it's just, it's just there as a, a, a creaminess, a, a very vague sort of coconutiness. Yeah. And may, yeah, maybe some lime, but some of that could be could be the Equinox. Um, it's yeah, Equinox very limey. I've always yeah. thought that. It's got loads of bubble gum off Equinox yeah. as well. Real bubblegummy hop. Wow, that's very soft feel. It's like I mean that that doesn't drink like eight percent. Putty didn't. Well, I think Putty did drink like ten. Um, that that feels like a pale ale to me. That feels similar to rustling substance somehow. It's very smooth. Yeah. Um, right. While we drink those, we're going to dig into the uh, into the questions. So. The first one we have is a super chat from the Magic Hat who says, any chance of a triple fruit card? Well, <laughs> you, never, you never know. It's been on my mind. I'll be, I'll be totally honest. I have thoughts about it. Um, okay. Yet to be decided. We're kind of thinking um, about uh, two triple IPA releases a year. So um, seeing, see, let's see how... Putter to tea goes, and uh, also, so it all started with interventions and I'd with first fire check. It's really worth mentioning Lucas and first fire check here because I wouldn't have even uh, tried to convince anyone else at Verdant about doing a triple IPA if it wasn't for him and their brewery. Because I was just blown away when we went over last March to Berlin and did a brew with them at um, how precise and amazing their brewery is and everyone that works there and the quality of their beers and the fact that they churn out triple IPAs like, you know, it doesn't matter doing triple IPA today and they're fucking good, really good. So it was a complete no brainer that when we did Little Summer Beer Bash that Lucas was coming over, that we should totally collab. And if we were ever gonna do our first triple IPA, it should be with him and as a collab with First Fire Check. So just wanted to get that out of the way. <laughs> Um, moving forwards, it was that confidence from that brew, you know, with Luke, Lucas holding my hand <laughs> through it, literally. Um, I would think I would have been probably too scared to attempt it otherwise, uh, that we've done putty to tea. And I'm kind of thinking about, well, I have already started trying to persuade the sales manager that actually a triple IPA should be a quarterly thing rather than a six monthly thing. And then it's about what are the other ones? It kind of feels like it, uh, two, two of them should be collabs and two of them should be amped up versions of existing beers. Don't know. So it's fruit car is a, it's right up there as a contender. <laughs> It's just where that's going to fit in with all the pulp brews you're going to be doing. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. um, right, Vernon beers have a distinct style. What do you think makes a difference over other breweries? Is it yeast or hops or dot, dot, dot? Um, both. I think it's, well, yeah, Sam's probably right. I mean, we, select, we try to select uh, the, as many hop varieties as we're allowed to via the hop companies. 
we don't try and select um, the definition of Simcoe or whatever. We just try and select what we perceive as exciting when we're when we're rubbing hops. Um, in terms of yeast, yes, we've got our own yeast strain. Started out as London Ale three, and through repitching, harvesting, repitching, harvesting, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, we got it analysed and banked, and then Lalaman got involved and is a distinct is basically mutated slightly from London L3, so that brings its own character. And I think above all of that is really to do with a combination of recipe, but mainly what goes on out there in the magic within the stainless steel trees. And at the very Which is the Adam just wandering around. Yeah, yeah, yeah Bigfoot out there. <laughs> so, it's um, the brew house, the cellar, and the packaging teams. But you know, the, the guys and girls out there, it's really about them, and uh, and that's the difference. I'll be perfectly honest. There's a, a, to an extent, it's the recipe and the ingredients, but then it's uh, this inherent kind of um, be, being on board with what feels right for third, and, and then that when it when it's on song. You know, I don't think anything's quite like it, and that's the character of Verdant. After the weekend, we're always coming in and talking about the cans we drank, and you know what we thought was good and what we thought could be better, and we're always trying to sort of push it to be to be better. You know, it's not just we don't do a thing because that's how we've always done it. So, is that there's a lot of passion in this place for sure. I mean, speaking of somebody who, you know, I've done work with you guys and been down there quite a bit. That's what, what always comes across. I remember the first time I ever came down, it was, I mean, it, the coffee had just been finished at about 11 a.m. and the cans started coming out and tasting it and really dissecting everything, every element of each beer that you, you were drinking, which I think is is why your beers, even when they're brand new like putty, feel very, very dialed in and considered. Yeah. Um, we, we try there's a real cynicism around New England IPA that it's it's kind of for basic beer drinkers and that there's no nuance or difference between it all and 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 you know that that's true if everybody's throwing the same hops in and using the same yeasts and not drinking can after can at the weekend and then talking about it but when you really dial it in you can make things that are very unique and I think we all talk about the same breweries that make great New England IPA that we did at the start which is Verdant, Treehouse, Alchemist, Other Half you know all of those names have been the best at it for a long time and i think that's probably because they have a similar approach to the way that they run their businesses and their brew houses yeah. um yeah. disco dave do we know what's in cryo hop does cryo pop have have sabro in it does cry pop uh we don't know you know it's never been disclosed it smells to like us. it does though yeah it kind of reminds me a lot of talus as well i think centennial's in it uh, I've, I've always had a hunch that Centennial is in it, but you know they 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 sent through a booklet. I think you can look on their website at the PDF of survivable compounds. So when they released Cryopop, we got a booklet through the post, old school, of their their research into the hot varieties that. I might have it. Yeah, yeah. I think I've I've definitely got it somewhere on my desk, but I would imagine. It would be like the top five or six all blended together into one thing, and then they put the name Cryopop on it. <laughs> but like the Sabro's up there. All I could find was my award winning book. That's a shame. Oh, oh, oh. That's ah. Ah. There we go, that's it. <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> Here you go, look. So, all I could find was this. Oh, <laughs> Brad's one for two. Nice. Yeah, there you go. This is going to all be all back to front, isn't it? No, no, no. It's good. It's good. Oh no, it's so, the right way around, isn't it? So, what's that top one? So, it looks like so Centennials the there has the most survivable compounds, right? So then it's ignore. They've then got Cryopop blend. Let's ignore that. So we've got Centennial, Idaho 7, Mosaic, Citra, Equinox, Simcoe, Crystal, Laurel, Comet, Chinook, Talus, Sabro, blah, blah, blah. So it's going to be, it will be like a half a dozen of those, I imagine. 
But they, like Sam said, it definitely feels like there's something Talus or sabro -y they're related to, like kind of coconut thing. Um, I just accidentally scrolled away from a great question that was just underneath that one about cryopop. Oh, you're going to fucking die now, Johnny. Here we go. I got it. 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 Will you ever do a sour, something like a, ooh, or something like a milkshake IPA? Um, milkshake IPA, no way. Uh, sour, maybe. We've done like a raspberry, whatever, and this. I think stuff. if that sort of thing happens, it'll be mixed firm in yeah, years to come. For sure. We got. So, yeah, I think like anything that's a bit sour or funky or barrel and etc. We, we've we've been very tempted, and we're close to getting some barrels in for stout, a portion of stout aging. It feels like if we're going to do it, we need to do it properly and not not just this little thing that is there. It's like, no, we need, a, we need a unit that's not too far away that we can really devote to this and the right people to be care passionately about it. So I think it's going to happen. I'm just not sure what, what the time scale is. But, uh, you know, everyone here is just wants to do everything really really well so it's you know sours farmhouse brett whatever it is barrels let's go but it's like when exactly i don't know but it, i'm sure it will happen <laughs> that's a good start brad, i think doing it? stuff like that you know yes exactly brad that's and that's that took us some time so i think whatever comes yeah. will be a while i think you're right there brad 100 percent like that kind of looking for a base beer is is really really key so yeah we, we there's there are rumblings of like a you know a for a barrel forum or a forum of sorts within verdant like a crew of people myself maybe four or five others meet weekly or monthly and start to dial down what it is we really want to achieve it because you don't enter that in in terms you know from a purely business perspective because that's ridiculous you know you're never going to really make any kind of profitability from that we're, we're doing that just because we're passionate about it and and for nothing else entirely and which is kind of how we approach everything else but we're just fortunate that it happens to be profitable <laughs> um yeah Right. Well, everyone, I'm, I'm gutted to say it, but we have now run out of time. Um, it's been it's been a privilege and an honour, um, and I'm glad I could get that sentence out because the putty the putty is starting to starting to slow down my speech. I think a little bit. I don't know where's why. Where's the emojis for the putty? Because it had a melting face, didn't it? That's... Oh yeah, I, yeah. I didn't show that. One sec. Where's it gone? Yeah, here were my emojis. <laughs> it's not there. It doesn't show. What? Sure, oh, melting man's there. I can see Melty Man. Yeah, he's Melty. Oh, I can also see Melty Man. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Melty Man's yeah, there. Yeah. Orange, Planet mango, Planet. peach, butt. Some uh, some kind of cocktail. And, uh, melty Man. <laughs> that that was booziness, the cocktail. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then Melty Man. Um, anybody that ever watched Coupling back in the early two thousands, the Melty Man will. Uh, be stuck with you um thank you marcus very much for that last super sticker it's been an absolute pleasure james and sam i can't thank you enough i wish we could have gone on all night because i think we probably could have um it probably would have been a terrible idea. we probably could have johnny <laughs> yeah um but i'm excited to say that hopefully if all plans go together brad and i will be visiting verdon later in the year to brew a collaboration yeah, yeah. Uh, as part of our 10-year celebrations yeah um, that's gonna be fucking cool it's gonna be amazing yeah so okay, you know maybe <laughs> West these sharks with brew one. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's going to be a triple West Coast uh, pulp inspired IPA. Let's, um, let's go. Let's brew two beers. Fuck it. <laughs> Why not? I'm up for it. Yeah. It's now recorded that you want to do two beers, so let's do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah great. <laughs> Done, isn't it? Now it's nailed up. <laughs> Get Billy on the phone. Uh, <laughs> yes. John, I, I need to say something. Oh, go on. I know you're wrapping up now. It's obvious, uh -oh. <laughs> but also, and I know you're just thanking us and everything, but I wanted to say thank you and Brad very much because, guys, you're the fucking pros. <laughs> thank you. It's always a pleasure to be on camera with you. You make it so very easy. Thank you. 
Well, bless you, James. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. You make the best IPA in, in Europe, possibly the world. So, <laughs> we do. Tower, it's okay. Um, we do. It went a bit weird, though. But yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll hug it out when we come see you. In um, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks to everybody in the comments and to everybody that's the, the bought the Taster Pack to be part of this. It supported the channel. It supported Verdant. Um, and it's it's supported getting uh, amazing New England IPA talked about in a way that isn't just people on Twitter being dicks about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's been great as well. Uh, we'll have another live show. Uh, we're doing an International Women's Day live show in March. Uh, so watch out for that. We'll make all the announcements as soon as we can. Um, otherwise, yeah, it, it's good night from Brad. It's good night from Johnny. <laughs> And it's good night <laughs> from Sam. But I didn't think this one through. I didn't know. Um, I wasn't sure where you go with that. But yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Thank you. Love and beer to everybody. I've got a banner for the end. I've got a banner for the end. Love and part, uh, everyone. Very good. Should have put three T's on that. Fuck it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Much love, everyone. This show's going live. If you miss anything, uh, for the moment we click done, it will go live on our YouTube channel as well. So you can watch back anything you miss. But we love you. We love James and Sam. We love Burden. We love beer. And we'll see you guys soon. Cheers. See you later, guys. <laughs>